the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, after Jesus had been born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, when Herod the king heard this, he was greatly troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the chief priests and the scribes, he asked where the Christ was to be born. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem of Judah, who are by no means smallest of the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the Magi secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, go, search diligently for the child. And when you find him, send me word that I too may come and worship him. And having listened to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star, which they had seen at its rising, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they entered the house and found the child and Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening up their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But being warned by Herod in a dream, but warned about Herod in a dream not to return to Herod, they returned to their country by another way. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks that all your word is given to us. All scripture is given to us for our learning. And so we pray now by your Holy Spirit that we would so hear, read, Mark, learn, and inwardly digest this your word that we would be changed more and more to be like Jesus for the sake of the world. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I have great hope for 2024. I have great hope for 2024 because of this story, this story here in Matthew chapter 2. You see, the coming of a new year always brings all kinds of uncertainties. I mean, we don't know exactly what's going to happen this year ahead, do we? I had a friend who asked me just the other day, how can I pray for you and your family for this new year ahead? And I said, oh, thank you very much. I said, the list is rather small. I said, uh, no broken legs, no surgeries, no holes in our roof, uh, no leaks through our kitchen ceiling, and no emergency veterinary visits because our miniature schnauzer has eaten seven chocolate bars. Yes, that happened twice. He lives somehow. You've got your own list. There are so many uncertainties that we face in this world. As our baptismal liturgy says in the prayer, that we would make our ways through this, the floods of this troublesome world. Right? We know the uncertainties, and yet in the midst of our uncertainties, we can have some certainty because of this story. This story gives us some things we can be certain of in this year, in every year. You see, we can be certain of this. This year, Jesus is going to be drawing people to himself. People are going to be drawn by Jesus. We can be certain of that this year because of this story here in Matthew 2. We can be sure of this too, that in this year, people are going to be dethroned by Jesus. People are going to have to let go of their sense of control of trying to be their own kings and queens, of trying to manage the universe around them and recognize there is one king and one Lord dethroned 
He's doing it. We can be certain of that this year. And because of this story here in Matthew chapter 2, not only can we be sure that people will be drawn by Jesus and dethroned by Jesus, but people are going to be discipled by Jesus this year. And we know it's a certainty because of this story. Let me show you what I mean. And by the way, when I talk about people, I'm talking about you and me. Not just the people out there. We're all going to experience this this year because of what this story tells us. First, we can be certain that this year people are going to be drawn by Jesus. When you look at the text here in Matthew chapter 2, you see the word behold used twice in the text. Now, behold is one of those words that sadly often gets mistranslated out of our English Bibles. When we translate out of Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, we sort of let the beholds go because we don't really talk like that anymore. We don't say, oh, behold, my friend, behold, I see this house over here. We don't talk like that. And so the English translation often removes the beholds. But the problem is, behold is a very theologically important word. It's meant to emphasize and give an exclamation mark to the text. It's meant to say, pay attention, something surprising, something shocking is about to happen. The two times we hear the word behold in this text, we're told, behold magi and behold a star. Now, what's the big shock and surprise about magi and a star? Well, first, verse one, behold magi. The surprise is, the shock is, that Gentile, learned astrologers, possibly magicians, that's how the word can translate, but let's be clear, in these days, it was the science of the day. The learned men of a pagan nation are here in Jerusalem saying, where's the one to be born king of the Jews? And let's be clear, it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just like they're saying, well, this is something interesting. No, they say we've come to worship him. That's what the first shock of this story is. The wrong kind of people have showed up looking for Jesus. And it's actually one of the proofs, like many other places in the Bible, of the truthfulness and the veracity and the authenticity of these stories. Because let's be clear, something this weird and strange that doesn't fit, if we were making this up, we would never have put this story in the Bible. It does not fit. It does not make sense unless it actually happened. This is what we see happening, that the nations are being drawn to Jesus. We're told that they saw his star at its rising. What exactly does that mean? What was that star doing? Was it a new star? Was it a star that was doing something different in the night sky? Was it a star converging with another star? Is it possible that as many of the astronomers and astrologers, let's remember these were the scientific gurus and learned men of their day, they had seen something in 7 BC where they saw Jupiter align with Saturn in the sign of the fishes. I know we don't follow astrology, but back then this was the science of the day, which by the way is a little reminder. Never put too much faith in the learned wisdom of our age. Because though we can learn so much from our scientists and scholars and it's, it's wonderful and it's helpful and it can be godly, remember that 50 years from now, we'll look back on some of the science of our generation and say, oh my goodness, they got that so wrong, right? This is always the case. As C.S. Lewis says, that's why anything that's not eternal is eternally out of date. We need to recognize that these magi, these brilliant men, saw something in the sky. Now, that moment with Jupiter and Saturn and the sign of the fishes, well, Jupiter meant the king of kings or the sort of universal king. Saturn represented Judea. And the sign of the fishes represented uh, the end times, the last days. So many scholars in that era that Jesus was born actually were expecting, based on scientific research, that the king of kings was going to be born in Judea to bring about the end times. They actually believed that. That was their scientific reckoning. And so based on what they've seen in the star, we don't know if that's what they saw in the sky. Matthew leaves other details just to say the point is they were drawn. How? They were drawn to the baby. That kind of draw, that kind of pull. Do you feel it? Well, let's go even further. Verse 9. Behold a star. Now, why is the star so shocking, right? It's not so shocking when you believe the Christmas carol version of the story, which gets it wrong. I know I've done this before. It's been several years since I've attacked the Christmas carol, We Three Kings, but I'm going to do it again. I've been doing it for over 20 years, and I'm not going to stop because this is what Scripture says. 
Here's what the tradition says about the star. It's beautiful, but it gets it totally wrong. The tradition says that the wise men saw the star in the east, and then the star started moving west. And they said, we better follow the star. So they followed it west, came to Jerusalem, and then it started going south to Bethlehem. And they followed it like a first century GPS. It was just beautiful. It led us right to Jesus. You know, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Right? It's not what the text says. Here's what the text says. Verse 2, they saw the star when it rose in the east. Something about that star told them to go to Judea. And so they went. They left the star in the east, in its place. They traveled west. They came to Judea. What did they say in Jerusalem? Where is he to be born king of the Jews? They don't know where to go next. What must happen? The scribes must be called. The scriptures must be opened. And through scripture, they determine, oh, the Messiah, the Christ, is to be born in Bethlehem. Notice it's now scripture, not the star leading them to Bethlehem. Again, a reminder, our science and our learning can take us very far, but on its own, it will never lead us to the Christ child. We need scripture to lead us to Jesus. So now, heading south, Led by scripture, not by stars, something happens. Therefore, the word behold shows up. Behold, the star. The star that they'd left in the east was now suddenly there, traveling before them and rested over the place where the child was. The star that they thought they left in the east was now with them. The star didn't lead them. What's then the star doing in the story? The star is following. The star is being led. The star is being pulled. The star is being drawn. The star is leading nothing. The star is being led just like the Magi to the Christ child. And you may say, this is ridiculous. Stars don't move like that. But if the creator of creation has entered into creation in flesh, will not the creation itself be pulled to worship. I mean, tell me what's more logical. The creator of the heavens moves into our universe and nothing exciting happens? Or is it more logical and more likely that if this story is true and the king of kings and the creator of all the cosmos comes into creation, then all of creation comes to worship him. That's the draw. That's the pull that this baby has. Can you feel it? The Magi felt it. The star felt it. And each and every one of us feels it this day. We feel that pull. You know, it's funny, 20 years ago when I first destroyed the Christmas carol, a parishioner came up to me afterwards, after the sermon. He said, I'm a physicist. And I thought, oh no. And he said, no. He said, this actually works. I said, it does? And he said, it does. Because I don't know anything about physics. He said, in physics, we understand that the larger the mass, the greater the pull it will have on smaller objects. Physicist, give me an amen, right? The larger the mass, the greater the gravitational pull on smaller objects. And as Queen Lucy from Narnia once said, in our world too, a stable once held something that was larger than the whole of the world. Is it not true that when the creator enters into his creation, we're all going to be drawn? And you know what is encouraging about this, what shows us the grace and the gospel in this is that it means that wherever we are on our journey with Jesus, whether you're a Christian today, whether you're on the edge of faith today, whether you're maybe struggling with your faith but still sort of seeking, wherever you are, it means that you're there because Jesus drew you there. Jesus has pulled you there. It's not because you made yourself ready. It's not because you made yourself appropriate and available and you made it happen. It's because God in his grace is drawing the world to himself. And just to be clear, that draw has a cost because when the baby in that house grows up, he will say in John chapter 12, 32, as he anticipates his own death, he'll say, and I, and I'm when I am lifted up, not just lifted up into heaven, but lifted up onto the wood of the cross, I will draw all people to myself. When I am lifted up, I will draw 
Everyone's me. That's what the crucified Christ does to the people of this world, draws them. Now, we also see in this text that we can be certain that this year not only will people be be drawn to Jesus and drawn closer to Jesus, but people will be dethroned by Jesus. Look at verse 3. Here is Herod the king greatly troubled, right? What's he troubled about? That they're coming to celebrate the one who's been born king of the Jews. Herod is troubled and all Jerusalem with him, we're told. Well, yes, because whenever Herod's in a bad mood, everyone's going to suffer. This is Herod the Great. Herod, the one who put three of his own sons to death to secure his throne. Herod, who Caesar Augustus said, it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. This Herod, who we're not surprised after the wise men do not return, in verse 16, this same Herod who will send his legionnaires into Bethlehem to slaughter every male child under the age of two. This Herod, the king. It's fascinating. We actually see in the text Herod being dethroned. Herod's kicked off his throne right in the text. It's right there. Matthew wrote this intentionally. Verse 1, Herod the king. Verse 3, Herod the king. And he's referenced as king up until verse 11. And then something Amazing happens in the text. After verse 11, when the Magi arrive and meet the true king of kings, the one who's been born king of the Jews, from that point on in the text, check my homework, check it right now. He's never referred to as king again. The rest of chapter two, he's Herod, 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 Herod. Where'd the king go? He's been kicked off his throne because they found the true king. They found the true Lord, the true ruler, and Herod is therefore been removed. Even up to his death in verse 19, Herod dies because they found the king of kings. Now, let me be clear. This is not just about Herod being dethroned. This is about you and I being dethroned. This is what Jesus is constantly doing. When he comes into a person's life, Jesus enters in and does the same thing every time. He declares himself king. He declares himself the Lord. He says, stop trying to control your destiny. Stop trying to run your life. Stop trying to tell me how to run my world and let me lead you. Let me shepherd you and guide you. You need to get off your throne. Every time Jesus comes into our life on a regular basis, there is more and more dethroning happening in our lives. What in your life and my life needs to be dethroned? What idols need to be put aside? What are we trying to cling to and be in control of? You know, we need to remember from passages like Matthew chapter two that we're not as smart as we think we are. We're not as strong as we think we are. We're certainly not as good as we think we are. We need to be humbled before the king. You know, it's interesting, humbling experience. We flew on Friday from Germany back home here. We had been there for a little, a little vacation after Christmas to visit Monica's dad. We hadn't seen him in years and it was such a wonderful time together. And as we're coming home, we got to get onto the largest uh, passenger aircraft that currently flies. We were, flew on an Airbus 380-800. Some of you have been on this thing. This is the double-decker plane, okay? This is the double-decker plane. Over 500 people fit on this plane, We're sitting on the upper deck, and I say to my children, you know there's an entire plane underneath us, right? There's two layers of this. I'm looking at this monster of a machine and thinking, how does this get into the air? I mean, talk about an aeronautical feat, like the science and the engineering to get this thing in the air. It's unbelievable. And we could think, wow, look at what humanity's achieved. It's incredible. And then we land in Dallas, and two of our six bags have not arrived. You can get that in the air, but you can't get my 14-year-old daughter's bag back to Dallas. We need to be humbled about what we can and can't do in this world. As 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? See, I can guarantee you with certainty that this year ahead, Jesus is not only drawing people to himself, but he's dethroning us all, every one of us, day by day. 
But thanks be to God, he's also discipling us. He doesn't just dethrone us and leave us there. He's then doing something with us. He's discipling us. Look at verse 12. The Magi, after they meet the child and worship and give their offerings, were told that in a dream, they were told not to return to Herod, but departed by another way. And Matthew is probably dropping a little hint word in here when he says way, because in the early church, before we were called Christians... We were called people of the way. That's what the early church was referred to, the people of the way, the way of Jesus. And so what is Matthew saying? He's saying they've met Christ, and guess what? Now they're on Christ's way. They're on a new way. Their life has changed. See, here's my point with discipleship in this passage. The greatest miracle, I think, in Matthew 2, greater than the fact that magi show up and are drawn here, greater than the fact that the star is drawn here and that this evil king is dethroned in our view, The greater miracle in this text is that these men are changed. That real transformation has happened in real lives. Because I don't know about you, but I can be pessimistic of this world and I can find myself saying, you know, people don't really change. The world doesn't really change. You know, things are just as they are. But the truth is the gospel says no. The gospel tells us that yes, to our own devices, people can't really change. But with the gospel of Jesus Christ, lives are fundamentally changed. It happens. It happens in our midst. We see it. I mean, look at Matthew, the tax collector. He wrote this. He knows it. There's that moment in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Talk about change of a life. It says, he writes his own story, one verse. He says, As he walked by, there was a man named Matthew sitting at a tax booth, and Jesus said, follow me, and he rose and followed him. He went on another way. Life change, life transformation. Do you believe it? Do you believe that there is change at work in this world because of the gospel? You know, on Thursday night, before we flew home and lost our luggage, we're sitting in, I'm sitting in Frankfurt Airport, and I got to sit down with a friend of mine. He's a priest. And he's a new friend. I've only known him for a few months. And I'm working more and more closely with him because of now the global work that I've been placed into as GAFCON general secretary. And so we're meeting, we're chatting. And here's here's the story, just in, in, in brief, just to give you a picture of what this kind of global ministry looks like. So this man was born as a Sunni Muslim, okay, into a militant Muslim family in the Middle East. He met Jesus about 20 years ago, radically transformed became a Christian, is now an Anglican priest, and has built a network of Muslim background believers, or MBBs as we call them, people coming out of Islam, right, into faith in Jesus, over 80 nations. So these are nations where you're not even sure there should be any Christians there, but there's Christians coming out of the woodwork all over the place, and they are everywhere, and this is growing, and I'm sitting there talking with him about our partnership and the way that I'm now supporting and assisting him in his work, and he slides across the table a copy of our Pray Daily. You know that little prayer book we built here at the cathedral a few years ago? It's a little mini prayer book that helps you pray through the day. You know, you flip to the week and go Tuesday, midday, now I know what to pray, right? It's all there, Monday through Sunday, every four times a day you can pray. He slides across the table and he says, this is why MBBs, Muslim background believers, are becoming Anglicans. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, we need a prayer book. And I said, you need a prayer book? He said, yes, because he said, a Muslim has learned to pray their whole life at certain times of day with certain prayers. He said, here's the problem. You convert to Christianity, and then the Muslim who's now a Christian says, when do I pray? And what do most evangelicals say? They say, oh, you can pray whenever you want, however you want, with whatever words you want. And we think, isn't that great? We've given them freedom. And the Muslim background believer says, what are you talking about? I can pray anytime, any way. And then you give them the prayer book. And you say, in the morning, on Monday, you pray like this. And on Monday, at midday, you pray like this. And at evening, and at bedtime, and the new Muslim Christian convert says, praise the Lord, I now know how to talk to my father. This is why a world of Muslim converts are becoming Anglicans in our very midst. Just to give you a flavor of the kind of work we, as a church, are now involved with because of this role. Receive the light of Christ, we said at the back, to show you have passed from darkness 
into light. That's the change that the gospel is bringing today in this world. It's happening in the world and it's happening in these pews and in our hearts right now. This is what we can be sure of in this year ahead. Oh, and by the way, I know some people have been very concerned over the last couple of months saying, well, now that you're the general secretary of this global Anglican thing, you know, I guess we're not going to see you much anymore. I mean, people have kind of written me off. Like, I guess we're not going to see you much anymore. I said, that's not true at all. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was on the plane, the double-decker plane coming back, and I thought, I got I to gotta prove this. I gotta, I've got to respond to this worry that I'm not going to be in the pulpit so much. I said, let me look back at how many Sundays I preached in 2023. And I looked, I preached 36 Sundays in 2023. I thought, okay, great. Then I looked at the schedule based on all my travel around the world. And guess what? I'm preaching 37 weeks here in 2024. Only God could do that. So I know you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll wait till the end of the year whether it actually happens. But the point is, praise the Lord, he's at work in the world. I am not worried about 2024. I am excited and hopeful about 2024. Not because there's not uncertainties. There are uncertainties in this world. But I'm at hope. I have hope because of the certainties that scripture gives us. This story gives us certainties we can lean into this year, no matter what this year contains. The certainties that people are going to be drawn to Jesus, including you and me. The certainties that people are going to be dethroned by Jesus, laying down our idols, laying down our our crowns, submitting to his lordship in whole areas of our life we didn't even know we could surrender to. And in this year, being certain that Jesus will be discipling his people. Real change in real people's lives, out there and right in here. Do you feel the pull? Do you feel the draw? Stop fighting. Stop resisting him. As this new year begins, simply say yes. Because remember, if a star can't resist his pull, how can you and I? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.